All right, so we ended last time with this definition of what a definite integral was. Which basically said the definite integral from a to b of a function f of x dx is equal to this limit as n goes to infinity of a sum. The sum is going to be over all these little rectangle areas where f of x star i is the height of the i rectangle for some choice of an x within a little piece of AB. Remember, AB is this interval, and we pick x0 to be this, or x1 to be this, and this is xn, and then we split this guy up into lots and lots of pieces. They're all the same width, and then this Whatever value that is, that's x2. Whatever value this is, that's x3. Whatever value this is, that's x4. Dot, dot, dot. And then, within each little interval, we pick some value and plug it into our function to get the height of the rectangle on that little sub-interval. Okay, so we pick one of these little guys that has a form like this, and we pick something in it that's a reverse element of symbol. So this guy is inside this. It's more proper to write this way, so I'll do that. So that's the function height. And then we multiply by the width of that height interval, which in the problems that we've been doing and we've been looking at on the, on the homework, we're always picking uniform width. We're not allowing any variation at all. So in general, you, you can have different widths. So if you pick the ith interval, maybe you picked this one, which is actually shorter than this one. right? So in general, you can allow for that type of thing. But for us, we just use all the same. And that all the same is just b minus a divided by n. Okie doke. Now that limit sometimes exists, which is great when it does. And in that case, we say the area, the definite integral of our function f. Okay? So the area underneath this function between it and the x-axis, in between a and b, a, b, This area, that's called the definite integral, and this is how it's defined. Okay. Um, as you saw right before class, when I was, or right before this, uh, when I was working with um, that quiz question, finding an antiderivative, I used this symbol without the limits, and I got something called the indefinite integral. That's essentially the function that you get that tells you the areas. Okay? So that's just a little bit of a recap from last time. Uh, quick question. Can this be negative? And by this, I mean the definite integral. It's an area, right? Can it be negative? If we look at how it's defined, we use function heights times interval widths. This is always a positive number. Okay. We're taking the length divided by a positive number. Does this have to be positive? No way. Pick any negative function. 
And then what you're doing is you're adding up a bunch of negatives, right? So there's functions, lots of them, which have a negative area. So we'll think of one. Um, let's think of this example. This is sine. Let's let a equal this value, which is pi, and b be this value, which is 2 pi. So let's find the definite integral from a to b, so from pi to 2 pi, of sine of x. What would you do? You would take this area, you would divide that interval from pi to 2 pi into lots of little pieces, right? You would plug in some choice of xi in each of these little intervals. And for each of these, you get a negative number here, times pi over n, 2 pi divided minus pi over n, right? That's a positive number. And what you're going to find is that this is a negative area. And as you take the limit as n goes to infinity of this sum, you definitely get something, which is exactly the area between the x-axis and sine of x from there. Right? It's a negative area. Okay, so this is like a, this is one of those things that I remember seeing for the first time and being like, oh, what does negative area even mean? back when I was sitting in your seat decades ago, and, uh, well, I'll let your science teachers talk about that a little bit more, but I assure you there's good reasons for negative areas. Okay, now let me ask you another question. Can this be zero? And we have zero area underneath the function. Quote, underneath. Big air quotes, underneath the function. So take a look at this function again. So what happens when you add up the area of all those rectangles from 0 to 2 pi of sine of x? Will all the positive rectangles, the positive area rectangles, exactly are canceled off by the negative area rectangles, despite the fact that this, you know, may seem intuitive? So this area underneath, what we really are always meaning is between the x-axis and the function. Okay? So underneath can really actually mean above. You just need to be careful with what you are using and thinking about. Okay? So now we get into um, this similar area that we kind of looked at when we were working with derivatives. We asked questions about when does a derivative exist and when doesn't it exist? And we sort of classify functions, like if a function is continuous, does that mean it's differentiable? Okay, maybe it's continuous and it doesn't have any cusps. Does that guarantee it's differentiable? Okay, maybe it's differentiable and it doesn't have any cusps and it doesn't have any jumps. Does that mean it's differentiable? We asked all these questions, right? 
and we boil down those necessary properties for something to be uh, differentiable. So this next theorem is something that gives you necessary conditions for something to be integral, or rather sufficient. Rather, you could have other properties which imply these things, but this is what you need. Okay, so if f is a function, that's the first key, you need to have a function, and continuous. on some interval, or, so here's, a, it appears as if this might be everything you need, continuous function on some closed interval, that's really nice and convenient, or F has only a finite number of jump discontinuities. Then F is integral. Again, the integral from a to b of f of x dx exists. So when you go through this process of plugging in partition values, finding rectangle areas, you let the limit of all those rectangles going to infinity, you actually come up with a number. That's, that's it. This is really nice, actually. Continuous function. You, if you've got any continuous function on some closed interval, you can integrate it. That's super easy, right? That's not the same for derivatives. Not at all. Give me a continuous function. It does not have to be differentiable. Right? There's lots of counterexamples. But what this says is, so long as it's continuous and it's a function, you can tell me the area below it or you know, the area, which is fantastic. But there's this uh, added thing here, which makes it even better for us. Not only doesn't it have to be continuous, right? Like, if it's not continuous, are we up creek? Can we still integrate it? Yes, we can, if it has a finite number of jumps. So a couple examples. Any continuous function. any continuous function. You can integrate that. It's not differentiable, but you can, you can integrate it. Or, if the function has discontinuities, As long as you can count them, so long, well, rather, so long as you can count them and it's a finite number, you can integrate them. So it doesn't even need to be continuous. Okay, that's a really fantastic result. You know, you might you might ask yourself why that is. Like, why can we allow this? Maybe you could, I think you could reason through why that's possible. If you remember that limits don't really care what's happening exactly at the limit value, they just care what's happening nearby, right? So then the next question is, why does it have to be a finite number of jumps? Why can't it be an infinite number? Yes? Those are open circles over there. Yeah, some of them, doesn't matter. They could all be open. Mm -hmm. But, uh, whatever, if you get into questions like that, then you're not really talking about 
Well, yes, you are, actually. When you start talking about infinite numbers of things, you're, you're talking less calculus one and more. Graduate school calculus one, which goes by another name. So, right. so let's go through, looks like, several examples. These are examples of sums. Uh, so this is actually stated in a theorem, but they're really just examples. So let's say, example one, I want you to add from i equals one up to n a bunch of ones. So let's say this is what you get. Right? You pick some function, you pick some interval partition, you multiply them out, and you get one for every single interval. That's the area of the rectangle. And you've got n rectangles. You add them all up, what do you get? It's one plus one plus dot 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 plus, there's n ones. When you add them all up, you get, of course, n, right? Okay. This is x to the 0, right? So this is the case of x to the 0 of power. Okay. Example 2. Same problem. Starting at 1, going up to n. You have some function, you pick some interval partition, you multiply them out, and instead of getting 1, now you get i. And you get this, which as a sum looks like 1, then 2, then 3, all the way up to n. Right? This is our function, this is what we're plugging in from 1 up to n. This is a very, very famous sum. Some of you might know a formula for this right off the bat. But let's take a look at it. Let's stop at 5. Okay. And I want you to think about this like here's the sum we're looking at. And here's the reverse of the sum we're looking at. If I add these vertically, what do I get? I get 6, I get 6, I get 6, 6, 6 for all of these. So this sum in red is really easy to do. That's, of course, 5 times 6, right? Which isn't what we're looking for. But that's exactly twice as much as we need. Because we took two of our lists. We added them together. So if I take that and divide it by 2, that's twice the sum that we're looking for. I take that number and divide it by 2, I get what I'm looking for. So you do this for any number n, and we look at the structure of what we have over there. You're going to get the number of things that you had times the number of things plus 1 divided by 2. So if we look at this, we've got five numbers added together. All of them in this double sum added up to 5 plus 1. Dividing it by 2 gives us our result. Who was it last time? I think it was maybe Michael or maybe somebody else. Maybe it was somebody gave me the answer to this last time really quickly, right? And then I tested them and I changed the limit up here multiple times and kept asking the same question. 
and they, they stopped eventually. But that's the trick they were using. If you're adding up consecutive numbers starting from 1 up to n, this is the formula. And this is a sum of the powers of x, right? x equals 1, x equals 2, x equals 3, all the way up. So these are just adding up to the function x, x to the first. The next function is going to be x, cubed, x squared. So this is 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus n squared. The nice little formula for this, not so easy to figure out, but there it is. So this is again adding up everything just like the function x squared. fourth one that they apparently think is really necessary to know, um, it's in your book, I'm not going to write it down, it's a sum of cubes, okay, and apparently it's n times n plus 1 over 2 squared. I'm not going to write it down. I, I, I haven't seen it. I could probably, have, I, don't, I don't think I've literally used that formula in 15 years. So, I'm not going to write that. These ones I've used, right, doing maths. This one a lot. Okay. Anyway, um, so that's a few of these sums that we've seen, or will see. Questions about how I found this one at all, or I'm not going to explain how this one comes around. And real quickly, we'll look at some properties of sums. If I give you a list of numbers, a1 plus a2 plus dot 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 plus an, I give you a list of them. Okay. And you add them up. Okay, that's that's the sum, right? Is that at all related to this process? I take this sum, I pick a number, and I multiply the whole sum by c. That's the same as multiplying this sum by c, right? Is that the same as multiplying each little piece of your sum by the constant first and then adding them all up? In other words, I give you a list of numbers, you add them all up, you tell me what number it is, then you multiply that number by c. Is that the same as I give you a list of numbers and you multiply each one first by that number, c times this, c times that, all the way down? Are these the same? The answer is yes. Yeah, you can definitely do this. We call this the distributive rule for addition. Right? If I give you this times this big sum, you can just distribute this constant through multiplying it by each guy in the list. Right? Yes. And that's the same as adding up adding up C times A1 plus C times A2 plus C times AN. It's the same because of the distributive rule for addition. That's the first property. So long as you have a finite sum, we can do this. So that you can factor out constants from your whole sum. Second property. Let's say I give you two lists of numbers. Okay, so 
so I give you a bunch of A's, okay, and I give you a bunch of B's. So this is a number that comes from the first list. This is a number that comes from some second list. And then I have you go through the list. Take the first thing from both lists out of the other. Take the second thing from both lists out of the other. Then go through and add all those sums together. Is that the same as adding up everything in your list, the first one, and adding that to adding everything up in the second list? The answer is yes, that's okay. This gives you some information about the ordering of how you have to add things together. If I give you two lists and I ask you what's the sum of the first list plus the sum of the second list, you can either do those individually or you can boil it down to one list by adding the first things, the second things, the third things, the fourth into one list and then adding everything in that one list together. Okay? That's the second property of sums. Third. is this one, again. But it changes one thing. That's minus sign. I give you two lists and ask you what's the difference of the two lists. You can either add the first list and subtract the whole sum of the second list, or you can take the first thing away from the first one Add that to the second thing taken away from the second thing. Add that to the third thing taken away from the third thing in the corresponding list. Either way, you're fine. So these three tools, multiplying constants, summing separate lists, or summing separate lists together, uh, they're just properties that are always true for lists. And so you can use them and help them to find these guys, which really at the heart of them are finding these definite integrals. Okay? Are we good at those or do we want to see some examples of those? I say see some examples, perhaps. <laughs> okay. Here's three good examples. One equals, or the size from sum from i equals 1 to 100 of 10. What is it? Got it yet? Counting on your fingers? Oh, boy. I only have two hands and two feet, and uh, I'm not taking my shoes off for this one. you got to give me a solution, which is <laughs> using only your, your voice or writing. See, when I look at that, I say, uh, that looks a lot like this. Right? Except it's not adding ones. It's adding tens. But 10 is a lot like 1. It's just 10 times 1. And by this property, number 1, I can take that 10 out. Right? Property 1. Now what is it? Well, the thing on the right, the sum on the right, is a sum from 1 to 100 of 1 which is just 100. So this is 100. 10 times 100 is 1,000.
Why did I do the thing with the 10 and the 1? Yeah, why'd you take the 10 out and then have it just... Well, I did it to try and show the result, right? Did you know the result prior? Okay, yeah, that's why. So this result, if I give you 100 ones and you add them all up, can you tell me what that is? Yeah, obviously, right? Okay. So by taking this 10 out, this becomes obvious. You've got 100 ones added together, right? So this is 100. Then just multiply by 10. Okay? This is not at all obvious. List 100 tens in your head, things start piling up. Unless you think of it like 100 tens. 100 times 10, that's 100 tens. Yeah? Yes? Sorry, what was that? Yes, this was rule one. See, I, each of these guys was a one. So one plus one plus dot 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 plus one. And we've got a ten out here. So ten times the one inside our cell. Mm -hmm. What does the I stand for? Oh, very good question. Um, right, it's your starting value in a sum. Uh, I is... That's a good way of saying it. It's, uh, I've heard it called an indexing variable. Um, another way to think of it is like a count variable. Um, all it is is it's it's when you see it here, it, it's representing hey, this is what this is what we're going to be plugging in to some formula. Okay, so this is the variable we're plugging into some formula. So it's telling you right off the bat here on the left side, this is our new variable, like x or y or whatever it is. It's just a letter to represent some something. Okay. And it tells you it's going to start at this number, and it's going to go up to this number, it's our end value, mm -hmm. and it's going to do that on the integers. Okay. So it's not going to do like 1.1, 1.3. It's going to go 1, 2, 3, 4. And these are all the values for it that you plug into this formula. Okay. Okay. Sometimes that formula is very simple, like this. Like here, our variable in this function is i. But there's no function here that, it, that uses i. The function is constantly 10. So you plug in 1, you get 10. You plug in 2, you get 10. You plug in 3, you get 10. Here, we're going to plug in. One. Then we're going to plug in two. Then we're going to plug in three. All the way down to ten. Our ending value for that index variable, or that count variable. Great question. Um, there's all sorts of like quote dummy variables that get thrown around in calculus, you know, like usually we write 100 i squared, it's like 100 x squared, but like for 
various reasons. Here's, the, here's one final reason. You replace it with something else. You know, x gets replaced by n, or x gets replaced, replaced by i to fit the situation, sort of thing. Here, the index. It's literally that idea of you've got like an index in a book, right? And it tells you alphabetically the page numbers for every single word in the book. Um, we're indexing all the terms in this sum. So we're giving you page numbers. Here's page one, here's page two, all the way down to the tenth page. So this is our index variable for our sum. Would we ever see a case where i is not one? Yes, all the time. Yeah. Yeah, oh yes. You've seen them already. Remember when we took left-hand interval? Or the, when we took the uh, area under the curve and we chose the left-hand endpoint? And we took the right-hand endpoint? Yeah. yeah. Sometimes when you want to switch between those things, if you've written your sum correctly, all you have to do is shift your index. Start counting at zero instead of counting at one. So like, here. We're going to write the exact same sum, but using different indices. You ready? 100 times what? Squared. Well, if now I start at 0, but I really want to start by squaring 1, to get from 0 to 1, I need to add 1. So this sum is identical to this one. You plug in 0, you get 100 times 1 squared. You plug in 1, you get 100 times 2 squared. Right? Okay, so it really does not matter where it starts in many cases. You can just rewrite it as a translation of your index. It's not always that way. Um, sometimes functions are given for how to go between indices, and they're not always one-to-one -one functions, in which case, and this happens, in which case you need to like, break your sum into all sorts of weird pieces and then re-add all them up after you re-index things. Like let's say if I, I said, hey, to go from this index to this index, you're going to use x squared. Okay? So now it preserves things, like because positives are preserved when you square. But what if my indices originally started with negatives? Like negative 10 up to positive 10. Now the squaring process has turned everything into positives. So my 10th term is now appearing twice, where the 10th was and the negative 10th was. Right, there's all sorts of things that can go wrong when you use indexing translations, which are not one-to-one. -one. So there's a whole study of that later on in math. Anyway, um, so no, it doesn't matter what you use for the most part. But asterisk, it really does. <laughs> you just got to be careful. Be smart about how you index them. Other questions? We haven't even finished this one. Yes? Sorry? No. I want the number. What is this? We'll get back to this again. What is it? Woo! Maybe. We're going to use this one. Right? This is really just 100 factored out of the sum. So I squared. So we're going to use this. Yeah? Why not use the first one? Oh, oh, this one. we got to use this one. I was pointing, yeah. I wish I was like six inches shorter, you know? We're going to use this one. Okay. Because 
we've got a sum of squares, which has this nice little formula, n, which is 10, times n plus 1, which is 11, times 2 times 10 plus 1, all divided by 6. So that one was just this rule applied to this sum. Um, we could cook up some examples for these ones if we wanted to. But maybe we've seen enough. What do you think? things are how we find definite integrals, right? We just set up a sum, we take a limit, we let it go to infinity. So now we're going to look at, real quickly, what happens with something um, about that sum if we reverse directions, if we reverse orders. A property of the definite integral. So when I write the sum from A to B or the integral from A to B of some function, what that really means is, again, break the interval A to B into a partition, find the rectangle areas, add them all up, take the limit as n goes to infinity, the number. How is that different from this? Where instead of starting at A and working to the right, we start at B and work to the left, adding things up in the opposite direction. So just real, real, real quickly, do the function values change if we choose the exact same points? The answer is no, but what about dx? What about the width of all these guys? Yes. That's going to change. Not in absolute value, but rather in sign. The way this was defined before was delta x was b minus a, and b was bigger than a. Right? So this is always a positive number. Divide by n. Well, yeah. Okay. What changes about it here? Well, now we're taking this as the last piece of our interval, and this is the beginning, but this is actually bigger than this. This number is exactly the opposite of that number. And this guy is going to be multiplied everywhere in your sum. So we can factor that negative sign out, right? Which means essentially factoring it out from this integral. So if I say, hey, I give, I'll give you this number, the integral from a to b of a function, you can change the order of these limits here if you put a negative sign in front of that integral sign. Okay?
In large part, that has to do, again, with just this fact that we've taken A to B, we've broken this up, and then we add in this direction. Right? But now here, what we're doing is we're doing the same thing and adding in this direction. We reorient, and we pay the price for the direction. Okay, a few more things. What's that? I give you any old function that's continuous or has a finite number of jump discontinuous. And I say from A to A, the area underneath that curve is what? And you say zero. Think about what that means again. We're taking some interval, A to B, and a function over it. We're adding up the area of all the rectangles. But what if this is actually this? What we're saying is, what is the area of this infinitely thin slice above the value x equals a? The answer is zero. When you use your calculus later on in a statistics course, you call these events of zero probability. Okay? So there's something that happens at a very infinitesimally small time period. And you ask what's the probability of that thing, which happens in an instant. It has zero probability. It's like stopping a movie of your life and in that frame, a single frame of your life, asking what's the probability that something happens when well, you can see everything that happens right there. So if it's not pictured, <laughs> zero probability. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, too. Events of probability happen. Events of probability zero happen all the time. Okay, now here's a few kind of special properties. This is a property of an integral. This, this is a property of an integral as well. Um, but here's some nice things to just see. So if I ask you, an A to B, and I give you a constant function, some number, and I want you to find the area underneath that number C from A to B. I have a picture, I pick some height C, I pick some A and B, and here's my curve. I'll just make it solid above. This is the function C, but it's solid above where I want to find the area. What is the area of this box? That's what this is saying, right? What is it? This is a rectangle with B minus A times the height. functions, and I want you to tell me the area underneath their sum. There's another way of writing this. If you think about these integral, this integral as a sum, like what we had on the board before, right? This is a limit of a sum. And in that sum, we've got a sum of two things. How can you rewrite sums? When you've got a sum of two things added together, you can rewrite it as two sums added together. Right? In other words, you can find the integral underneath, the area underneath this function, and then you can add it to the area underneath 
because this integral is really just a sum of sums, and that sum of sums we can write like this now, take two little sums and add them together individually, and that's really nice. What if instead of having just a constant here, what if I have any constant times any function that we can integrate? Well, the rule that we saw employed here and here for sums can be employed here as well. We can take this constant out front of the integral sum. So if we scale our function, we make it taller or shorter by some constant multiple, and then find the area underneath it, that's the same as not scaling. Find the area underneath it, and then scale the area as opposed to the original height. No difference. Okay? Right. And then the next and last little property is exactly what we had before with differences. If you have a difference of two functions in an integral, that's the same as integrating each and taking the difference. That's the next and last property of integrals. a conceptual question here. If I've got some function that's always non-negative, so it's either zero or it's positive on some integral, meaning if I were to make you graph this from A to B, you can graph anywhere up here or on the x-axis, but you cannot go down here. So yeah, play around with how you can graph this. What can you tell me about the area underneath this curve, between the x-axis and the function? Maybe. Can it be zero? What if I just draw a zero line on the x-axis? Yes, it can be zero. Can it be negative? No, never, because the function values are always positive the interval width is positive. So we've always got positive area rectangles up here in that giant sum. We add them all up to get this, and that means we get something positive. So we either have something zero or positive, which means if you have a non-negative function, non-negative means zero or positive, and you find the area between the x-axis and it from A to B, you're going to get some pop, some non-negative number, guaranteed. Next question: If f of x is greater than or equal to g of x on some interval, okay? So you got two functions. You can compare them. One of them is always bigger than the other. What can you tell me about the areas underneath them? Which one's bigger? Which one's
becomes smaller. Can they be the same? I mean, it stands to reason that because the height of any rectangle underneath F is taller than or the same height as a rectangle here, this area is going to be bigger than that area. How do I draw something smaller than this graph? Can I draw above it or below it? I'm going to draw the graph for g of x now, right? Can I draw above it? No. If I'm drawing something smaller, it has to be below it, right? So I'll take a point here and I'll always stay below it. I can come up to it, but I can never go above it. In both these cases, the area is a negative value, right? In both cases, the area is negative. Uh, I want the area under f of x is this area. That's a negative number. The area for the red one is this. also a negative number. Which one's bigger? It's the negative number which is closer to zero, right? Which is definitely the blue one. Okay, I think this picture makes a lot of sense when we've got functions that are up here, you know? f of x, g of x. Clearly, this area here is less than this area here, clearly. We've got big positive numbers bigger than a small positive number. With negatives, things get flipped around. The bigger it is down here, actually the more negative it is, right? That means it's smaller. So you actually want the smaller area here underneath the axis being the bigger one. So this, this is true no matter if f and g are positive, negative, zero, whatever. So long as f is bigger than g, we have that relationship between the integrals. Okay, now here is an estimation method. I'd be lying if I said this was never used. I'd also be lying if I said this is rarely used, aka this is used all the time. It is very common that you cannot calculate some integral. Very common. And so you resort to these estimation properties of integrals, which, which are, this is one of them. Let's say you can come up with some little m, so it's some number. It's always less than or equal to your function. You can think of it like a minimum value. And you can come up with a maximum value. Some number which is always bigger than or equal to your function. That gives you guaranteed estimates for the size of this integral. You can always estimate this integral by the area of a rectangle below by the minimum height rectangle, above by the maximum height integral or rectangle. In pictures, what this says is if I draw some function. Okay. 
I can always find this capital M right I can always find this little m little m is always smaller than or equal to our function big m is always bigger than or equal to our function and I can estimate this area above by using the area of this blue rectangle. It's a big positive number, right? It's definitely bigger than the area under the curve because we've got a positive, a negative, a positive, a negative. It's going to be less than the area of this rectangle. Or below the area of this rectangle down here. Right? So this one always underestimates your integral. This one always overestimates your rectangle. Sorry, always underestimates your integral. This one always overestimates your integral. And uh, that can be very useful. Maybe not on such a coarse scale, but on finer scales where you need to approximate on some small piece of your integral. In those cases, you're going to have much less error. But this is a handy tool. Um, this goes by a special name. It goes by maximum modulus estimation or minimum modulus estimation. You take the size, maximum size of your function or the minimum size of your function. So the maximum min modulus estimation, if you care to look that sort of thing up. Very handy tool, frequently used. Got a few minutes left, but uh, that's the end of 5.2. It's a very broad description of what an integral is. Like we haven't done any, right? I think in the homework even there's quite a few uh, there's problems where you're estimating still using rectangles, and there's probably some questions as well where you're um, writing down the sum and then taking the limit. Right, so at that stage of the uh, game, I think. Um, if you have any questions, if you're working on your homework over break, or if you've already worked on it, shoot me an email if you have any questions. Other than that, thank you for a wonderful first most of the class. Happy Thanksgiving. I'll see you when you return. Hopefully not eight pounds on average heavier. Or, ho or hopefully yes, I, I guess. I mean, that would mean it was like good eating, right? So, enjoy your break. Enjoy your family time.